What I wanted to talk about today was um, why it is that we measure PSOR, why it is that it's so difficult and where the errors are, and also how it is that we correct those errors. And I'm honestly not sure why it is, but it seems like all of a sudden there's a growing interest in PSOR and we see a lot of new higher PSOR regulators. We see a lot of, you know, um, other related measurements like PSMR and PSNR. And so one question is why is this demand growing so much? And I think it's because as uh, performance levels improve and as power rail voltages go down, we become a lot more sensitive to noise and we become a lot more aware of the noise. And as we become more aware of it, we need to figure out where it is that it comes from and how it is that it gets there. And one of the most basic paths is PSOR, you know, through the uh, power supplies. And so even, even with a high PSOR regulator, still some noise gets through. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today, why it is that we need to, to measure this, what the interest is, why it is that it can go so wrong, and how it is that you can make good measurements. So one reason that we have to measure PSOR is because even the tiniest levels of noise um, actually get get into our circuits and it doesn't take a lot to mess up a circuit. I'm gonna show you that pretty soon. Um, this is a, a picture of uh, clock spectrum noise on a modern oscilloscope. So this is a high band with high sample rate oscilloscope and it does allow us to look at uh, clock spectrum. And I measured this directly on one of our demo boards. It's our VRTS3 board that happens to have 125 megahertz clock on it. And so it was very convenient for us to use that. Um, that board actually has two different power supplies that we can choose to power this clock from. And more importantly, it has SMA connectors that connect to that power plane. And that allows us to directly add noise onto the power supply so I could get pictures like this. And um, you can see in the yellow trace down on the bottom, that's actually what the clock signal looks like. And then the uh, blue trace, the, the lower blue trace shows the power supply noise. And you can see the 18 microvolt signal that I added with a signal generator. And when you look at the clock spectrum, you can see that shows up in the clock spectrum also. 18 microvolts isn't a very big signal. And if you tried to see that in the time domain, you probably wouldn't be able to. Uh, and yet when you look at the spur that it creates in the clock spectrum, it's really big. As that's one reason that we, we care about measuring this. Um, I made these measurements quite a while ago for a series that I did called Designing Power for Sensitive Circuits. And that was really a whole series. It came out as two articles. It came out as a webinar. There was a keynote that I did in Beijing. But it was a really wildly uh, popular topic. And now uh, Rodian Schwartz was generous and lent me an FSWP, Signal Source Analyzer, to make some really sensitive measurements. On the left-hand side, you can see the actual noise of the three power supplies that we used to get that uh, board powered. This is still our VRTS3 demo board. And I said it has two regulators on the board that we can select from. One is a switching regulator. One is a LDO regulator. And I said it also has SMAs connected to the power plane so that we could use our own power supply if we want to. And I did choose a third power supply. It's what we're going to call a noiseless source. It's the PicoTest uh, line injector, which has only about 2.2 nanovolt per root hertz noise density. That's about the lowest we have. And so we're going to call that a noiseless power supply. And so on the left-hand side, you can actually see um, the noise density as a function of frequency plotted directly on this FSWP analyzer. So the switching regulator in the noise band integrated from a kilohertz to 100 kilohertz is about one millivolt peak to peak. The LDO regulator is about 100 microvolts peak to peak. And the line injector is about one microvolt peak to peak. The signal source analyzer also has the ability to measure phase noise of the oscillator. And so we're looking at the phase noise of that same 125 megahertz oscillator on the right-hand side. A couple of really interesting things here. Uh, the first is that if you look at the red bars, it kind of marked a uh, region from about one kilohertz up to about one megahertz. And you can see below a kilohertz, there's not really a difference what power supply we use. 
and above a megahertz, not so much either, although you can see the spur that's created by the 2.8 megahertz switching power supply there on the right. It's not very big. It doesn't integrate very much, but it's there. And then you can see the phase noise of the three power supplies. And you can see it's really significantly different for these three power supplies between one kilohertz and one megahertz. And if you look at the lower right corner, we also plotted jitter, right? This analyzer does phase noise, but it can also integrate the phase noise as jitter. I also made that a little bigger and a little bit easier to see in that little top square on the right-hand side. So with the noiseless power supply, our oscillator gives us about one and a half picoseconds of jitter. That's pretty good, actually. With the LDO regulator, it gets 6.6 .6 picoseconds of jitter. And with the switching power supply, it gets 22 picoseconds of jitter. And so one thing that's really clear here is that it makes a really big difference in terms of jitter, how much power supply noise there is. And so that's, again, why it is that we have such an interest in, in uh, measuring PSR. And you can see that even these very tiny little signals show up as phase noise and they create uh, jitter. One thing that is interesting, and I went into it in a lot of detail in designing power for sensitive circuits, is that why would the switching power supply have so much noise in the one kilohertz to one meg megahertz region? If it's a 2.8 megahertz switcher, we would expect that the fundamental noise would be at 2.8 megahertz. And like I said, I covered this in a lot of detail in designing power for sensitive circuits, but that noise is created by the jitter of the switching frequency of the switching regulator. So it's probably the first uh, first time I've actually seen what I refer to now as jitter-induced jitter. So the jitter in the switching regulator creates this noise density that creates very low level noise around a millivolt peak to peak, and that millivolt peak to peak increased their noise density by much more than order of magnitude. So it's really significant. And again, that's the reason that we're interested. If you happen to be working on FPGAs, I use this example here. Most uh, data sheets look a lot like this. I happen to choose the Vertex 7 because I had it handy. But every one of these has this table that tells us what it is that the voltages are allowed to be on the power rail. And it's different for each one of the each one of the power supplies. So you can see that there are MGT and uh, transceiver voltages, and there's the VCC aux, VCC uh, TT, and these power the GTX and GTH transceivers. I did a paper with Heidi Barnes um, from Keysight and Jack Carroll at Xilinx at DesignCon back in 2018. And the reason we did this paper is that Xilinx themselves had trouble meeting these, these limits. Uh, but in any case, these are their, their limits. And so for the majority of these, you know, I put red boxes around them so that you can see them. And I assume that half of the noise that we're gonna allow is from uh, actual AC dynamic noise and half of it is gonna be DC regulation. And that, that's relatively arbitrary, but it's a pretty good rule of thumb. And so if you look at each one of these power rails, in the red boxes, it says that we have a, a total window that we're allowed to operate in of 30 millivolts peak to peak. That, that's the actual noise that we're allowed to put on the power rail. And if you look at that note on the bottom, and this is right out of the Vertex 7 FPGA data sheet, it says that as the amplitude of the noise should be limited to less than 10 millivolts peak to peak. And that's kind of interesting because it's not in the table but they just told you that you're allowed 10 millivolts peak to peak of AC noise. So yes, you're allowed um, whatever that is, 60 millivolts peak to peak for the entire window, but they can only tolerate 10 millivolts peak to peak of AC noise. And that does in some ways make it, that does in, in some ways make it simple for us. And in some ways it get, makes it more complicated. And it makes it more complicated because I just showed you that uh, phase lock loops are sensitive in certain regions, frequency regions of uh, of the phase lock loop. And so Xilinx decided that they would just give us that voltage window, but without the frequency element. And so without the frequency element, we know that we're only allowed to have 10 millivolts peak to peak, but we don't know in what frequency range we're allowed to have it. And so in some ways it made it easier because it gave us a number. And in other ways, it made it more difficult because now we have to meet 10 millivolts everywhere. 
There's another note here that tends to hurt us, and that says that we should design a power supply filter that's going to attenuate the switching regulators to meet this requirement, and that tends to get us into trouble also. Uh, Florian Hamley showed this back in Symposium 7, and he showed how it was that a ferrite bead in a ceramic capacitor showed up as a spur in a USB oscilloscope. And here's just a measurement of a ferrite bead and ceramic capacitor that I made here in my own lab. And you can see that while it did filter out higher frequency noise, it also increased the noise by a factor of 10 at the resonance of the ferrite bead in the ceramic capacitor. And so these ferrite beads aren't always a good solution and they need to be used really carefully. And that's something that I spent a lot of time talking about in the designing power for sensitive circuits uh, series also. And if we look at PSOR of a typical regulator versus phase margin, I'm showing that on the right-hand side here. And you can see that at low frequency, this regulator has about 60 dB of PSOR. Most of the newer regulators can do much better than that. But as the stability gets degraded, you can see we get these very large dips in PSOR. So at 13 degrees of phase margin and at 10 kilohertz, you can see we don't get 60 dB anymore. We only get 30 dB. And so there are system level issues that get into our PSR, and that includes the filters, uh, particularly for our beads, and it also includes the stability of a voltage regulator. Of course, the stability of a voltage regulator isn't the same in the system as it is out of the system. And the decoupling capacitors on the board, those impact stability, these um, ferry beads, those impact stability. Uh, input filters that might be on the board also impact stability. So one of the things that's important about assessing PSOR is that we assess it at the system level and not just at the power supply level. There are a couple other things that get us into trouble, and that is that most current mode switching regulators don't tell us much about slope compensation. In fact, most manufacturers consider that to be secret sauce. And so even if you ask for it, they won't tell you what it is. Um, Ray Ridley wrote about this in his thesis in 1990, and he called this the audio null. And what he showed was that at some particular ramp and some particular uh, filter inductance, you actually do get a null in audio susceptibility, creating very high PSR. And that's kind of interesting because when we measure switching regulators, they tend not to be anywhere near that, that point. Um, in fact, we did a workshop Oh, I think it was back maybe five or six years ago at Texas Instrument. And we chose 12 of their voltage regulators to uh, get evaluation boards for, measure them, create the models, and then optimize them. And one of the things that we found is for the most part, all of their uh, regulators were severely overcompensated. And in a couple, couple of cases, we had access to the slope compensation so that we could correct it. And in, in one case, we actually did achieve about a 40 dB improvement in PSR just by changing the slope compensation capacitor. And so that, that's something important to, to be aware of, and that is one of the things that tends to get us into trouble. So now it's abundantly clear why we need to make these measurements. A lot of the loads are really sensitive to the power supply noise. The filters that are created um, you know, from the ferry beads and ceramic capacitors are often recommended by the manufacturers and even specified in the data sheets. But when those aren't properly damped, they actually create more noise than they resolve, and it can get us into trouble. The VRM control loop stability is degraded by power supply effects. The PCB and, and decoupling capacitors can degrade stability. It can also improve stability. And so those can either reduce noise or increase noise. And so it's important for us to evaluate that. And of course, slope compensation, like I just said, also impacts PSR. And it's something that we can optimize to get the optimum PSR. So if it's clear that we need to measure it, the question is, how do we do that? And in very simple terms, we take the dot and we inject noise at the input side and we measure the noise at the output side. So if this were a voltage regulator, we would attempt to put an AC noise signal onto the input power supply, and then we would measure the signal that came out of it at the same frequency with the Bode 100. It's a simple gain measurement. The question is, how do we get the noise signal onto the power supply? There's a couple of ways we can do it. And some of these have actually seen in data sheets and, and maybe they could work in some cases, but in most cases they won't. 
Uh, the first is the bias T, and the bias T has a couple of disadvantages. One is that it has really poor bandwidth. And the second is that it generates really small signals because the power supply impedance is very low, and we're powering it through a, low, a relatively high source impedance of 50 ohms. Uh, I've even seen some transceivers that have half ohm inputs, and they are attempting to uh, modulate from 40 hertz to 10 megahertz, and they suggest possibly using a bias T, it would be really difficult to create such a thing. Another possibility is power amplifiers, and I've seen power amplifiers used in some cases, but there are a number of issues with doing it. One is that as a voltage control loop, the power amp output impedance is inductive, and that tends to make the, the amplifier unstable. Um, I have an interesting article about that called The Inductive Nature of Voltage Control Loops. And if you're interested, that'll talk about why it is that these amplifiers become unstable. They also have very limited bandwidth and relatively uh, high impedance, and they will resonate because of the, the inductive output. And then you can use line injectors, or, and line injectors are essentially solid state summing junctions. They have very, very wide bandwidth. They don't have a control loop, and that's an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is it can't be unstabilized. Um, it has very low source impedance. We can get big signals, uh, but it also has some disadvantages, one of which is that the output voltage isn't constant, uh, though we can fix that with a remote sense filter. And with a much lower uh, source impedance, that means that we can generate modulation signals that are both much bigger and also much wider bandwidth. One interesting thing is that whether or not we're talking about power supply rejection ratio, which is the measurement of the input signal and output signal of a power supply, or two sister measurements, PSMR, which injects the signal the same way, but it measures modulation on a, for example, RF amplifier, and PSNR, which applies to things like transceivers, and it's essentially the same thing also, injects the same kind of noise levels, but it looks directly at, at jitter and bit error rate. And whether or not we're going to measure PSR, PSMR, or PSNR, the injection methods are exactly the same. The only thing that's different is that how we evaluate the output. In the PSR test, we take the line injector, we put an AC signal into it. The AC signal comes from the Bode 100 uh, output. And then we measure two signals. We measure the signal at the input of our dot and we measure the signal at the output of our dot, and however it is that we evaluate that, whether it's in voltage, whether it's in phase noise, or whether it's in jitter, um, this measurement is the same thing. So we're measuring output, however that, that means to you. For PSR in particular, we're measuring a voltage regulator, so we measure the voltage noise at the input, and we measure the voltage noise at the output. This becomes kind of difficult, so let's let's, try something really simple. You know, I always say that you have to measure something you do know before you can measure something that you don't. And with microvolt sensitivities, we need to measure PSRs that are on the order of 100 dB or, or even more. Um, I just measured one that was at 125 dB. And so I tried measuring this 100 dB attenuator and I ended up with this plot. You can see at low frequency, I ended up with only about minus 80 dB or minus 82 dB. And at higher frequencies above, say, 100 kilohertz, you can see I did measure 100 dB. So at low frequencies, I have on almost 700% error. 700% is an awful lot. Um, and that can get us into lots of trouble. So one of the questions is, where did the 700% error come from? And then, of course, once we know where it comes from, we want to know how to fix it. And so this isn't all that easy. Uh, first is that we have to be able to measure this output signal, and this output signal is really tiny. I did an article uh, at Signal Integrity Journal on the ultimate power rail noise measurements. And I won't say that there's one measurement that works all the time, but it does show what the different noise levels look like for different types of probes, um, including the PML 1110s, which do offer much lower noise. And you can see the, the measurements of that in that article. So if the measurement signal is really tiny and we measure all of the signals in the same instrument, for example, a Bode 100, then we could have currents flowing in the ground shields of the cables. And in fact, for sure, we have currents running in those ground shields. That creates small error signals that are essentially ground bounce for you um, digital guys. I mean, digital guys are familiar with ground bounce. That's what it looks like. It looks like ground bounce. 
We could use a differential probe, but a differential probe doesn't work either. And the reason is the differential probes are much too noisy to be able to measure microvolt signals. They tend to be very high impedance, wide bandwidth probes. And so the noise is much too high for us to be making measurements uh, for something like this. We have to inject high frequencies and injecting high frequencies into low impedances presents its own challenges because the interconnects themselves get in the way. Even just a short set of mini grabber or mini hook, you know, wires are quite inductive and those will resonate with the board. And if the board is low impedance, it'll also attenuate the signal acting like a low pass filter. So if we look at how this error gets created, it looks something like this diagram that I, I drew and actually made a hundred dB attenuator here for the purposes of these measurements. And you can see I built a, a T attenuator at 50 ohm resistors on each side to make it impedance matched. And then I connected it to a VNA. And you can see the cable shield resistances here are 43 milliohms on each side. And that 43 milliohms on each side, those become in parallel like the uh, little video clip shows on the right. And so part of the signal is floating on top of this uh, ground shield. And the signal is floating in those ground shields gets measured by the receivers and that's where the error comes from. And so one of the things that we have to do is try to minimize the effects of those shield resistances. I calculated this mathematically also. There's always somebody that asks me, you know, can you prove it? Do you have the math for that? You know, I don't have that simulator. Can you show me how it works? And so I did this and I looked at the same attenuator uh, using two different shield resistances. On the left, you can see I got, um, oh, I think that is 100 microohms. So near zero, we'll call it. And I calculated the attenuation with a shield resistance of zero. And you can see the attenuator uh, actually measures minus 99.6 dB, very close to the 100 dB expected. And if we uh, sweep the shield resistance at 43 milliohms, you can see that we end up with about minus 73 uh, dB. So we end up with about what it is that I showed in the measurement. And that's where the error comes from is that shield resistance. So obviously one of the things that we can do to try to improve the PSR measurement is to reduce the, the shield resistance. If we do the simulations, including cables, then we will get the, the right answers. And here I did two separate cases, one using uh, PCOS SPDN cables that have low resistance and standard RG316 cables. And you can see that there's a factor of three difference just between two cables of the same length, 10 dB difference between the two cables. So that says that one of the things that we could do is we could use lower resistance cables. And that either means better cables, or it means shorter cables, or it means both. Um, you know, a shorter, better cable would be the best solution, of course. You can also see that as we approach higher frequencies, the two signals start to converge. And the reason that they start to converge is that the cables themselves start to form a coaxial transformer, and those tend to isolate the ground loop. So this is a low frequency issue. At higher frequencies, typically above about a megahertz or so, the cables themselves will, will correct the error. And so how do we fix it? Well, we can take a look here. Um, the cable really matters. Using low shield resistance cables will help a lot improve the coupling on the output side by adding a, a coaxial transformer, that'll help a lot too. You can see that in the uh, green trace. Uh, the, the better cable is in the blue trace. If we can calibrate a short, that'll help a lot. Um, most of the error is at really low uh, magnitudes, and so the short calibration is the one that's the most important for us to get this measurement right. It does seem like a differential probe would be the way to go, and it really isn't. Like I said, differential probes tend to be really noisy. A semi-floating amplifier might work if it's low impedance, but um, but differential probes just have too much impedance. So here's what the ideal setup looks like. We have the line injector, which is a, typically a low resistance, around 100 or 200 milliohms. And there, that's not an accident either. You know, you might ask why it is we don't make that resistance lower. The reason is that there are a lot of specifications, like the transceiver specifications, that specifically require the resistance to be between 100 and 200 milliohms. But also, that 100 to 200 milliohms provides damping for the cable, so we tend not to resonate things, and we really don't want to resonate things. 
Um, then we want to use cables. We like to use cables as short as we can. And we want to use low shield resistance cables. And I did mention that one of the downsides to an unregulated line injector is that the voltage is current dependent. You can't add remote sensing for that. The remote sensing needs a filter. And the filter is for the purpose of not regulating out the modulation signal itself. We want to regulate DC, but we don't want to regulate out the signal that we're trying to modulate. And then that goes into the dot and coming out of the dot, um, ideally we'll have a coaxial transformer that'll help isolate the ground loop or a semi-floating amplifier. When we're using the probes, we'd really like to use probes that are as low noise as we can. If you can tolerate 50 ohms, then you know our P2104s and P2105s are about as low noise as they get. And if you need to use uh, higher impedance probes, the PML1110 is really good. So we're not done yet. We're trying to drive this um, high bandwidth signal into a board, and the board has lots of uh, capacitors. It'd be really hard to get high frequencies across these very large capacitors. It would take hundreds of amps of modulation signal to do it. Uh, and so most of the specifications require us to remove any filters or capacitors from the, the modulator before we make the measurement. In some cases, you're not going to be able to do that. Some circuits actually do require some input capacitors, particularly volt LDL regulators. They typically tend to need input capacitors. So you want to remove as many as you can, but you'll need to leave some of them. These measurements are getting pretty extreme. If you look at the latest QSFP modulator spec for transceivers, and that is a pretty broad uh, area right now, almost everybody seems to be incorporating transceivers and, and measuring them. The QSFP spec requires that we inject a signal of 10 megahertz to um, 40 hertz to 10 megahertz. There are some modulators that are going up as high as 40 megahertz. We actually just got our first requirement to modulate the power line at 800 megahertz. And so the frequencies definitely are going up and that makes the problems more difficult. And so if the cables are in the way, there is an obvious solution, and that is to eliminate the cables. And so what we did at, at PicoTest is we turned the line injector into a probe. Of course, the probe still has a lot of power dissipation, so how do you get that cooled? We made it a water-cooled probe. And you can see in that picture, there's a little water-cooling pump and, and uh, radiator assembly, and that uh, feeds into this little probe head, and then the probe head allows us to have these very short interconnects, and that lets us get up to the, the 10 megahertz level. Going beyond that, it's still hard to get through even that short piece of wire since the transceiver itself looks like about a half ohm resistor. And so we can still inject large signals, but we need to modulate the, the amplitude of the, of the input signal in order to get the same level output. So for example, at 250 megahertz, we might have to put in 500 millivolts to get out 50 millivolts, but we can still modulate it. Most specifications require us to modulate somewhere between 50 millivolts peak to peak and 100 millivolts peak to peak. And here you can see in the upper right, this is actually at the OSFP uh, conference just last week. You can see the modulation of a transceiver and you can see that they're measuring PSNR. So you can see the, the PAM4 eye diagram in, in their scope. And that's what they're measuring is how the eye diagram changes as a function of the line modulation. Anyway, this is what that actual plot looks like. Um, this is measured in a 70 gigahertz oscilloscope, and uh, and we're just measuring the modulation signal. The signal is required to, to have a 3 dB band with a 40 hertz to 10 megahertz, and you can see we have a lot of margin on the high side and a little bit of margin on the low side. Uh, but that that's how we do it. And so that's everything that, that we need to know about measuring PSRR and also its sisters, PSMR and PSNR. There's a lot more information about this that you can find on our website. In fact, um, in our PSR measurements page, you'll find a lot of that. Uh, you can find information about this both on the Omicron Lab website and also the PicoTest website. And of course, you can always email us if you have questions. I'm always happy to answer them. And you can also look at the PicoTest online forum. People do tend to ask me a lot of questions there. And of course, answering them on the forum means that everybody can see the answers. So that's really helpful. Anyway, I appreciate your spending your time with me today. And I hope you learned a lot about PSOR.